Before we get started with today's podcast, I want to let you all know about an upcoming program, A Day with New York Times best-selling author Thomas More, on October 27th in Glen Ellen at St. Mark's Church, and October 28th at Conference Chicago at the University Center in the South Loop. For more information about this program, visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Jungian Psychology and Human Spirituality, Liberation from Tribalism in Religious Life, with Robert Moore, Ph.D. This episode is part one of the series Jungian Psychology and Human Spirituality, Liberation from Tribalism in Religious Life. It was recorded in 1989. In this seminar, Dr. Moore stresses that although it is important that people find and affirm their common human spiritual roots, it is time to realize that tribalism in human culture, politics, and religion must be transcended. Jungian thought may be a vehicle to assist in facilitating that process. Robert Moore, Ph.D., was Distinguished Service Professor of Psychology, Psychoanalysis, and Spirituality in the Graduate Center of the Chicago Theological Seminary, where he was founding director of the new Institute for Advanced Studies in Spirituality and Wellness. An internationally recognized psychoanalyst and consultant in private practice in Chicago, he served as a training analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago and was director of research for the Institute for Integrative Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy and the Chicago Center for Integrative Psychotherapy. Author and editor of numerous books in psychology and spirituality, he lectured internationally on his formulation of a neo-Jungian psychoanalysis and integrative psychotherapy. His publications include The Archetype of Initiation, Sacred Space, Ritual Process, and Personal Transformation, The Magician and the Analyst, The Archetype of the Magus in Occult Spirituality and Jungian Psychology, and Facing the Dragon, Confronting Personal and Spiritual Grandiosity. To listen to the complete series, click on the link in the description, and we'll also have links to all of Dr. Moore's lectures. You can support us by clicking on the link to shop on Amazon or to make a donation. You can always visit our store to further your own investigations into analytical psychology. I'm happy to see all of you here. I didn't know how many people would be interested in this topic not because it's not an interesting and important topic, but because there is so much denial today about the radical importance of this topic. Uh, People tend to get into the idea that this is sort of one of those uh, uh, sort of theosophical, uh, dreamy kind of speculations that, uh, that you know, have been popular in the history of the human race. Uh, you know, they, they uh, think anybody that addresses the issue of human spirituality, the idea that there might be such a thing as human spirituality, uh, are uh, sort of dreamy and out of contact with reality. And <clears throat> that's extremely unfortunate um, uh, because the first thing that I'd like to to get into is why this why addressing this topic aggressively is uh, so important today. Uh, what we're going to do uh, this weekend is I'm just going to sketch for you the broad outlines of what I see to be our um, situation uh, as a species. Uh, spiritually and psychologically, and the way in which that affects our situation on the planet. Uh, 
I'm going to try to lay out for you what I believe to be uh, the resources, uh, uh, particularly available today, which make it possible for us to think in a systematic and realistic way about the task facing us as a species. And um, quite simply, I would say that it is my belief that we now have the resources which we need to begin to address uh, the fundamental uh, spiritual task of, uh, of our species. Uh, and this is not to begin to address uh, the fundamental uh, spiritual task of, uh, of our species. Uh, and this is not something, in my view, that has, that has uh, been the case very long. Um, uh, let me just say a word about uh, myself and why I'm interested in this. Um, and then I will jump into our diagnostics. I want to start with diagnostics. And then I want to just outline for you the way I'm going to approach this. And uh, then we'll jump in over our heads and see if we can swim. Um, I'm Robert Moore. I'm a Jungian psychoanalyst. Um, I'm not a Jungian analyst because I don't know anything else. I was an Adlerian analyst before I was a Jungian analyst. Uh, my first book was a Freudian book. I continue to study contemporary Freudian theory with the um, psychoanalytic school of self-psychology, uh, uh, modeled after Kohut. But I'm a Jungian, I <clears throat> and happy to make that claim because I feel that Jung psychology is far and away superior as a psychology of the human to anything that is remotely in second place. That is not to say that it is an archetypal psychology. I don't believe in any archetypal psychology. That would be, a, that would be perhaps the true God's psychology, archetypal perfect psychology. You know. uh, but I believe it is a wonderful psychology of the archetypes, which is not the same as archetypal psychology. I want to make that very clear. I'm not a Hillmanian. I'm a Jungian. We'll get in uh, a little later to making this, the distinction between being a Jungian and being a, an archetypal psychologist. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, I'm professor of psychology and religion at the Chicago Theological Seminary, where I teach uh, rabbis, priests, religious, and other clergy, and interested laity at the master's and doctoral level in the relationship between psychology and spirituality and uh, psychology and religion. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, have been working in this area for longer than I would like to admit. I was just thinking about it. Uh, uh, it was 1965 in the summer when I was in my 20s when some guy really set me off on a trip by introducing me to uh, Alfred North Whitehead, Carl Jung, and Ludwig von Bertalanzi. If you don't know who that is, that was the founder and primary uh, theoretician of general systems theory. And that was just like somebody had put LSD in my wild turkey or something. <laughs> because that so blew my mind, and, and I've never been the same since. And I have spent a ridiculous amount of money and time and energy and blood, sweat, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, trying to figure out the implications of all that for, uh, for uh, the religious life and psychology. I don't really regret it, but I was really amused, amused thinking back that it's been that long now, since 1965 in the summer. Um, since then, I've been working pretty constantly in this uh, and uh, have uh, continued and uh, and really feel that this, that this stuff that we're talking about this weekend, this is the most important topic that there is. Quite simply, because if it is not dealt with, we will not very long have the opportunity to deal with any other topics. Uh, I think it's very important for us to understand 
I'm going to, in our discussion this weekend, I will try to help you understand the psychodynamics about why we don't discuss this more. Because there are clear psychological reasons why we do not, and they have to do with infantile grandiosity uh, in our psyches and the way in which it gets overstimulated. And when you start looking at the problems facing the human race, it is so overstimulating to the grandiosity that it's like having a 300-pound St. Bernard jumping around in your head. And you have to shut it down. And this is a common understanding in psychoanalytic self-psychology, and I will be going into what happens when you start uh, letting yourself feel grandiose enough to, to address our grandiose problems. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is not anything fancy. This is just basic self-psychology, and I want us to understand how it works to, in keeping us from addressing the problems of the human race. My basic feeling is we've got, to, we've got to intervene in these dynamics so that we can ask and address the problems that are quite grandiose. These are, these are grandiose problems that we face as a species. Uh, and they require uh, the capacity of the mind to address them and begin to formulate strategies to deal with them. And so uh, uh, I'll just share with you, although this is, in my view, the most important topic that one can discuss, I expected there to be maybe 10. If this workshop made, I thought there might be maybe 10 people that would come because the denial is so massive on these fronts and our fear of the, the uh, being overwhelmed by the grandiosity, the messianic complex, is so great that uh, people steer away from this. They would rather watch soap operas or something. You know, it's much more self-soothing. So anyway, that's kind of the uh, way I feel about this, and uh, I work a lot in this area. I'm the editor of this Paulist Press series you may be aware of uh, on Jungian spirituality, Jungian world spirituality, in which we are trying to provide a forum for uh, bringing the, the greatest of the world's spiritual uh, geniuses and uh, spiritual traditions into dialogue through using Jungian psychoanalysis as a, as a holding environment. A, a way of providing a context for discussion for people who won't discuss um, uh, any other way. Uh, and we now have, the first volume is back here, the Jung and Christian Spirituality. The second volume on Jung, the Jung-Christian Dialogue, is, is almost ready to go to press. The third volume on uh, Jung and Buddhism uh, is almost ready, will be ready in the fall. We're planning volumes on at least one volume uh, uh, bringing together the best resources on, on each of the major spiritual traditions in dialogue with uh, Jung. There are six volumes now under contract and many more being uh, envisioned and we will try to do this as long as it's, it's possible. Paulus Press has been very um, enthusiastic and helpful in, uh, in seeing the importance of this project. That's one project of the Institute for World Spirituality, which, uh, which I work with, along with many other people, like-minded people. <clears throat> Brand new institute. Uh, another uh, project is the, what we call now the International Directory of World Religions, which you may not realize this, but, but right now, there is, if, if someone wanted to contact all of the religious leaders and religious groups in the human race, you could not do it because there's no reference work which would enable you to know how to reach them, who they are, where they are, how to reach them. Uh, <clears throat> our institute is well on the, way, on the way now to, for the first time in history, having a reference work which will be kept in print through which you can contact every religion on the face of the earth uh, by phone uh, if you need to. And I think that is sort of a symbol. That is to say, um, if Chardin is correct that there is a burgeoning planetary consciousness, then you would assume that one spinoff of that would be that uh, that, uh, that might have some uh, manifestation in communications improvement. So uh, uh, I think there's some evidence that uh, in the relatively near future, the, poss the potential for communication among religionists the world over will increase rather exponentially. So, uh, 
So there are a number of perspectives on this, but let me just begin by, <clears throat> first I'll say how I want to proceed, and then we'll get into this. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the nature and dynamics of, uh, of human tribalism and um, give you a few introductory uh, pegs to, to, on which you can think about the dynamics behind that. I'll be going into it far more when I get into the psychology, uh, uh, which I, I don't know how long it's going to take me to get there, uh, I, at least by in the morning. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I'm going to elaborate the dynamics of uh, the psychodynamics of human evil uh, as, a, as a psychological uh, underpinning of the um, uh, way in which we have to think about uh, human religious and spiritual tribalism because quite clearly it is a manifestation of the demonic uh, and it is a very clear um, uh, reflection of the ubiquity in human beings of the grandiosity that the self-psychologists talk about as uh, infantile grandiosity uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that infantile grandiosity does in the human psyche is it splits it it splits the psyche, it splits relationships, uh, it creates uh, division in, in relationships. And so we'll be elaborating that quite a lot later, but I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on it in doing our diagnostics. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about resources that are available today and what they have pointed to as the diagnostics of our situation. <clears throat> I will go into uh, the, the enormous significance of Mercy Iliadi's work and try to give you a little idea about the why he's important. Uh, you know a lot about Joseph Campbell, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I'll, I'll relate that to Joseph Campbell's popularity of his work. And then I'll begin talking about Jung, the, the, the reason why Jung, why you need Jung and not just Iliadi, or Jung and not just Campbell, uh, and uh, try to help you get a handle on uh, why Jungian psychology is so important as a resource today for these issues. Uh, and I will differentiate a little bit between Jungian psychology and other psychologies uh, and in, this, in this context. Uh, then probably, if we get to it today, it's fine, but if we don't, uh, tomorrow morning, I'll be talking about uh, the psychology of human evil uh, and the way in which it feeds religious tribalism uh, and uh, religious arrogance, religious hubris. Uh, on the planet and keeps uh, people off of the task, the human task. See, the fact is that religion has been a great problem for human beings uh, since the globe began, began to shrink and the human community began to have to have more to do with each other. See. And uh, uh, then uh, after I lay that out and, and insights from Jungian, Jungian thought about how to deal with that, uh, elaborated from some contemporary psychoanalytic self-psychology, we will turn to uh, some reflections on what we need to do uh, in terms of responding to uh, our situation with, with ritual, various forms of prayer. In that short, the relationship between the development of human spirituality uh, uh, and dealing with our planetary problems. So that's a lot to do. We will hit the high spots, and uh, I'll tell you where the stuff is buried uh, that you can read on your own to elaborate this outline. Is that okay? Okay. Any question? Any questions before I jump in now about how we will proceed? Yes. Uh, not a question about how you proceed. I'm yes. curious if, if you're being taped. Yes, I think I am. And are those just going to be available? Yes, through the institute. Uh, Tony. Like yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Don't break your wrist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Are you going to be talking about Paul Ricoeur? I can. Uh, I, I think that Ricoeur's approach is, is important in terms of uh, deliteralization. Um, but I don't think Ricoeur or his approach to things is, is going to be much of a solution because it would take so long to teach enough people enough about Paul Ricoeur that we're all going to burn to a crisp long before that would ever work. So I don't really think that, I mean, I'm a practical man. 
I'm an academic, but I deal with real people and real problems. Most academics don't. And so uh, the University of Chicago, while I'm one of their alums and a great appreciator, the University of Chicago and its modes of analysis is not going to solve the problems of the planet. Um, uh, just like the consulting room psychoanalysis. See, I just lost $1,000 by going down and lecturing uh, to this spirituality, Jung and Spirituality Conference. Now, I didn't do that because I'm altruistic. I did it because psychoanalysis in the consulting room is not going to do it either. There's not enough time for us to train enough analysts. And there's not enough money for us to get people into analysis to address the human crisis that we're in now. Let me just talk a little bit about the human crisis. We'll get back into that and we'll talk more about it. Uh, and while I'm saying what else is not going to work, deconstructionism isn't going to work either. There's a lot of fascination with deconstructionism. Today. Everybody's into deconstructionism. Well, we need to construct a cosmos. We're already good enough at deconstructing it. Uh, we, need to, we need to get past literalism, literalism, but a lot of these people that are, that are wild about deconstructionism never deal with the issue of how you're going to say anything significant. Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll get into the ins and outs of that a little later. But let me talk about uh, our problem as, as I see it. Contrary to what the secularist would like to have us believe, secularism has not brought great progress to the human race. All you have to do is to get serious about your evaluation of the ecological problems of this planet and look closely at the data we already have, not, not some speculation, but the data we already have about what our species is doing to other species and what the voracious, insatiable appetites of human narcissism are doing to this planet. We have, all, we have enough information now, if the denial level wasn't so bad, to make it clear uh, to anybody that has any interest in this uh, that this cannot be just an academic topic. You know, a sort of a, well, this is something you get into if you if you're bored and, you know, you kind of want to do something to cope with your boredom. Uh, this is a survival business, radically serious survival business. And the fact that that's not widely understood is a mark of the pall of enchantment that hangs over this planet. You know, I'm not, you know, uh, for all the world, the way, the, the metaphors which you need to understand what has happened in, his, in, in human consciousness are available more in C.S. Lewis than they are in many other places. Uh, our planet lives under this enormous cloud of, of enchantment of consciousness, a massive, massive human denial, uh, which uh, uh, you can get a little sense for by reading Ernest Becker's work, Ernest Becker's work, uh, particularly his book, The Denial of Death. Uh, it's a lot more serious than Becker points out in there. He thinks it's serious, but it's more serious than that because it's not just the denial of death. It's just massive denial about all sorts of human problems. Um, our denial of the ecological situation is one of the most central issues. And the way, uh, although our, so many of our well-meaning uh, social critics, uh, there are so many of them that will not look at the psychological nature of our human problems. The, a lot of my friends in the... Uh, uh, concerned and committed church circles think that psychology is the enemy. And they think if you're interested in psychology, you're, you're just a total navel gazer, and you're, the only reason you do that is because you're trying to get away from the world's problems. And they really believe if you become uh, a Marxist that, you know, you don't, you know, and you can kind of translate... Uh, religious categories into Marxist categories, and then if you could just get everybody to be Marxist, uh, well, the world's problem would just disappear. Uh, you know, Marxists would never engage in cocaine traffic. Do you know that? You, if you were a Marxist, you wouldn't have to shoot any of your generals for, uh, for, for smuggling cocaine in the United States. Did you know that? If you were a Marxist, you would never have any 
uh, radical totalitarian uh, uh, executions of people who were longing for human freedom. Did you know that? We wouldn't have any executions of students. We wouldn't shoot students in the streets if you were Marxist. Uh, and so much, in it, you can go on and on that forever. It makes me sick because it shows such an incredible naivete. They never read Reinhold Niebuhr, or if they did, they didn't understand him, you know, about the, uh, the dynamics of human pride and how they afflict all ideologies. The human, the human situation is not because we got the wrong ideology. Uh, uh, and so what our task is today is to get out of some of this, uh, what Robert Bly would call the naive male and naive female approach to the human situation. Uh, <laughs> Bly is fond of pointing out, you know, there, there, are some, there are some bad things out here in the world. And uh, they, are, they are real. And uh, in some significant way, poetry and folklore and myth have always pointed out that it's in us. And it wouldn't matter what ideology we had. We would corrupt it uh, for narcissistic purposes. Uh, and this is the kind of thing which it seems to me <clears throat> that makes psychoanalytic interpretation in general and Jungian reflection in particular so key if we're going to have a chance in even understanding the problem that we've got, much less the solution, the potential solutions. So uh, let me just get into this a little bit. There are a lot of people today who feel that we need to go back to tribal cultures and tribal forms, and that will be our solution. Uh, to human problems and, and and they differ only on one thing that is which tribe you go back to you know I mean we've got people that want to go back to the uh, 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 Hopi and there are people that want to go back to the Navajo and there are people that you know I mean I've been getting letters from all these people that are going to you know from all these tribes that, to write with a series and, and the numbers of tribes spiritual tribes are enormous uh, but what we have to do is get a little feeling for what tribal culture is like. See, for the tribe, in, pre, in the pre-modern world, for the tribe, the tribe was the human race. You see. In other words, anybody that wasn't in the tribe was not human. Uh, you, you can see this, and did you ever watch the movie Little Big Man? If you haven't seen Little Big Man, you ought to get that. You'd probably get it for two dollars now or something at the VCR shop. But, uh, in there, there's a good characterization of this, in which uh, the uh, the in, in the way they've translated the Indian language, uh, the tribe are called human beings. The 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 translation of the name for persons in their tribe are human beings, and members of the tribe are human beings, and members that are not in the tribe are not human beings. Now, this is something that is enormously important, because as long as your tribe is not in contact with any other tribe, this is fine. You know, if I just the other night I saw this movie, uh, I, had never, I had never seen The Lost Horizon before. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that 1930s, you've got to get that too. I'm going to give you lots of movies to see. It's part of the tuition cost of this course, all those, all those rentals that you've got to do. But anyway, so here in the mountains of the Himalayas, there's this little civilization there, and you can't get there from here. I mean, it's like the only way you, you can have, you can be kidnapped and your pilot can die and something, and you can crash and you can get there. But it's surrounded by mountains and storms and snow, and you can't get in there from here. And so their tribalism in there uh, is fine, because you don't really have to deal with anybody from the outside. And you've got to realize that for a long time in the history of the human race, that was close to being the situation of a lot of tribes. You know, we still find tribes in the jungles, you know, that have not had any contact with any other tribes. So they don't have any theological problems, see, about this. But what about those, <laughs> you know? And uh, where did uh, Adam and Eve, Eve's children find people to marry? See, they, they, didn't, they didn't have that too much. But, uh, but as human culture 
has increasingly been been marked by contact with other other people that are not in your tribe. Uh, this has become an increasing uh, issue. Now it's very interesting to study the history of human warfare on this. Because very often people will tell me that, uh, uh, well, human beings have always been into war and destruction and everything in an unlimited way. And I say, well, you know, they always, there's always, uh, it's true that human beings have got the warrior inside. And I'm going to lay out for you what I consider the, inner, the geography of inner space a little later. And the bad news is this, inside every one of you uh, is this, in, not in the software, but in the hardware, there is a warrior. And whatever your warrior sees, it wants to fight. It, you know, it, that's what it does. And that's always been true in the human race. But what a lot of these people don't realize is that in the pre-modern era, certainly when tribal cultures dominated, they had ritual and all of their warfare was ritualized it was there were rituals of warfare for what purpose to limit it to contain it to control it i said a little while ago that i don't think modernity is an improvement there are lots of reasons why it isn't and one of the main ones is here. The increasing modernization in warfare is an increasing lowering of the level of consciousness about ritualization in warfare. In other words, you can't go up to the war college today and find a course, Ritualization of Warfare 302. See, you, if you go to the war college, you, you won't find a part of the curriculum that says, now these are the rituals we engage in to make sure we don't kill too many of the enemy. <laughs> That's why we have nuclear proliferation to the degree that it is today. We're not satisfied with killing all of them once. We want to kill all of them as many times as possible. And see, if you understand the history of warfare, if you understand a ritualization in warfare, you will understand what an aberrant approach to this we have today. We're in a sort of a psychotic state as a species today about this. Because in the, in the, in the tribal era, we would go to war and we'd have our ritualization to get all cranked up. We knew how to make warriors and we'd paint up, you know, we'd, you know, get into hollering. It's like being at a Robert Bly Men's conference, you know. <laughs> beating those drums, making those war noises. Boy, you feel all that warrior energy. We even got some of those around the city here. If you want to learn about being a warrior, we got a warrior organization. Anyway, they'd get, they'd get on, they'd have their war dance. Well, now, they weren't just into doing the two-step of those things, Texas two-step. These were not just, we didn't get together and dance for fun. That was ritual. It was, it was a ritual process designed to create a certain consciousness for a certain purpose. Then they would engage the enemy, but were they interested usually in destroying the entire tribe? Not usually. Not usually. They were interested in taking some captives for ritual purposes. They would raid uh, the American Indians, they'd call it count and coup. In fact, a lot of the time, if you were really super warrior, you know, you would go over and you'd want to go over there and ride your pony over there and touch the pony of the best warrior on the other side and then run back to your side. Then kill him. You want to go over there and touch his pony and then run back without him being able to get you. Now, look at that. Talk about masculinity. Now, that males are so much like that. I'm more of a warrior than you. My name is Stallone. Excuse me, Rambo. But now you ought to be able to see in this, see, if, if you really study this stuff, you will find that there was great limitation, self-limiting, built-in ritual structures. 
in the tribal consciousness with regard to the destructiveness of even the warlike impulse. Um, there were similar structures to regulate consumption. Now, there are probably people in this group today that know a lot more about this than I do, but can you give me an example of the way in which in tribal culture, in tribal cultures, consumption was regulated? Do you, do you know any examples of that? That is, uh, materialism? Did, how did they regulate materialism? You got an example, anybody? Nature was the great regulator. Nature was the great regulator. When it was there, you waited. Well, that, well nature certainly, uh, you know, in one, in one sense is the regulator, but I'm talking about cultural regulators or religious regulators. Did you ever hear of, uh, of uh, potlatch? What is, somebody define it. Well, what is that, what's that about, potlatch? Isn't that a great giveaway uh, for people of all tribes or whatever within a tribe? People come from far off and then you give away what you've got to them. That's right. For, to show how wealthy you are, how powerful, how generous, and so on. It's, it's, uh, it is an occasion you get, you, you build up some wealth, you get so many ponies or pigs or whatever, and then there comes a time when you don't keep on accumulating it. You throw a party so to speak. You know, we still have a little of that in, in party giving. I mean, if you know how to throw a party, you have a little bit of, of, of that left in your psyche. It's sort of in there, you know. Gift giving. Uh, we don't know enough about the psychology of gift giving, but it's related to this. Gift giving is really related to this archetypal sort of uh, insight. Uh, but anyway, in Podlatch, you would, you would throw this party for the, for the tribe. And you'd give away all this stuff. Now, a little later, I want you to remind me, I'm not going to deal with this right now, but I want you to remind me to relate that to the archetype of king and queen. Because uh, it is, in, cer in certain ways, a very, it may look like a very arrogant act. But if you understand the archetypal foundation of it, it's not arrogant at all. It is what has to be done to create a world, create a cosmos. It is the generosity of the king and queen that manifest. See? And I'll lay that out for you shortly. But anyway, the point is very simple here. There are, there are rituals in tribal culture to limit aggression. There are rituals in tribal culture to limit consumption, conspicuous consumption, and the results of that. Now, Again, if you look at our culture today, our modern modern culture, we have no rituals to limit aggression, and we have no rituals to limit consumption. Let's see, what were you going to say? Yes. Uh, I'm surprised where you're going. At first, I thought what you were going to do was then talk about the rituals that we do have that limit aggression and consumption, because we're so caught up still in nationalism and tribalism. But it seems to me that summit meetings, going to the mountain all of the kind of the dances, taking a double picture of um, Mrs. Bush oh. and um, the, the Minister Thatcher's husband kissing one another's hands. I mean, it seems... Well, let me define, let me give you a definition that will help you deal with that a little. There's a difference between ritual and acting out. Humans will always engage in ritualization, consciously or unconsciously. But when I use the word ritual, I'm talking about something that is that is a... One is taking responsibility for leadership of your group in things that have to be done. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that are acting out ritual forms, archetypal ritual forms, but they're not contained. That is to say, uh, these leaders don't understand. Uh, for example, our leaders in the Vietnam War uh, were, were limiting aggression in a certain way but they did not know what they were doing in any kind of psychological ritual sense. Uh, uh, the decisions not to bomb certain areas were not made on the basis of ritual judgments. Um, they probably were grounded in some unconscious awareness, you see. But what our job, see this is where Jungian psychology comes in. I want to talk about a little bit later about the ego-self axis the Jungian understanding that you must become aware of the responsibility to relate to archetypal contents consciously. 
There is an ethic of awareness in Jungian thought that is a must. It's not enough to act out obsessive compulsive rituals. In other words, we are condemned unconsciously to act out what we do not consciously ritualize. Let me say that again. That is a fundamental assumption I'm operating on. We are condemned unconsciously to act out archetypal configurations that we do not consciously ritualize. And this has enormous implications, enormous implications politically and socially uh, for global culture. <coughs> Let me just say one word about that and then I'll take your question. We, uh, I have a, along with uh, my co-worker Douglas Gillette, I have a, a manuscript uh, with a publisher now uh, entitled Nuclear War, The Last Right. And in that we argue that there is an unconscious archetypal pressure toward nuclear war that will be acted out unless a human planetary spiritual consciousness can be developed to understand what this pressure to act out the global conflagration is spiritually. In other words, we are all going to undergo, I will guarantee you today that we will undergo a spiritual transformation soon. There will be a great cleansing of the planet Earth. That is guaranteed by the archetypal configurations in the human psyche. The question is whether it will be acting out and we see ourselves as purified in the great fireball or whether we take conscious responsibility for the changes that will be required for us to realize that the transformation that is required is a sacrifice of our infantile grandiosity as a species and not the literal, here's where the deconstructionists are allies in this, we must not take literally the necessity to dismember the human race. See, do you follow that? Here's the bad news from a Jungian point of view. The bad news is there really are archetypes. There really is an archetype of death and rebirth that is behind the apocalypse myth. If you study the dreams of children throughout the world, or if you study world mythology, you will find in every major tradition the great, the <coughs> myth of the great conflagration. In this manuscript that Doug and I have got now, we have an appendix of about 50 pages in which we collate these myths of the great fire. Now that is in the psyche. If you are a Jungian, now if you're not a Jungian, it's not a problem, but if you're a Jungian, you don't think you can ignore these, these things in the psyche. Myths for a Jungian are not the same as myths for some uh, academic mythologist. That's why I'm going to get into the difference between academic mythologist and a Jungian. Because for a Jungian, we are convinced that these things are psychoactive whether you like it or not. Archetypes influence you. You can't help it. They're in your hardware. The only thing you can do is either relate to them consciously and responsibly or you can act them out. Uh, that's one of the fundamental assumptions here. And so you can see where I'm going here. In, in tribal cultures, they had rituals. They were not... You may, you may morally frown on, you know, what they were going to do with those prisoners that they took. A lot of the tribes, they brought them in and they sacrificed them. them. And ate them. A lot of them ate them. Primitive mass. You see? Literally. But I must point out to you that maybe it was two or three or five. And for a while, they wouldn't have any more raids. In other words, they didn't get into a fantasy of having to kill off everybody. You needed those folks as a source of, of sacrifices. See, So you weren't going to totally destroy them. In, in a very deep way, that's morally superior to modernity. Because our 
our arrogant modern egos talk a good line. Oh, we're very uh, humanitarian. Uh, we got Amnesty International. Uh, we keep tabs on how many people are being tortured. We are so superior. And all the while, we've got radical increase every year in our amount of overkill in our nuclear we in our nuclear arsenal. Oh, we're so sophisticated. We're so superior to these tribal peoples. But we, our, our the nuclear proliferation grows exponentially all over the planet. Now it is not just in the second world, not just in the third world, but there aren't any groups now, any major groups on the planet that are not pressing for nuclear capabilities, nuclear delivery systems, and nuclear weapons. Now, if you're not a Jungian, you won't pay much attention to that. But if you're a Jungian, and you think that the human race has an instinctual pressure toward transformation, then you will look at that, and you will you will think different things about it. He was first, and I'll come to you. Okay. So, uh, when an example of a, a, a ritual to to regulate consumption, instead of when Bush went to Poland and said, "Here, you know, here's twenty or thirty million dollars," which is which he takes out of petty cash, says, "Okay, here I'm going to give you uh, you know ten executives from all the Fortune 500 companies, and you got them for five years until you revitalize your economy. That's something of value to to him." And um, and then, and then he, he, gives, he gives that away, which is going to hurt his economy. Right. See, that's the thing. That, 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 so that, would that be... Well, that, that, you that, know, we can play, we can have a little fun uh, toward the end. In fact, I'll just give you your assignment now. I want you to play with the idea of what concrete actions and ritualizations. In other words, if I were to say, okay, team, we're going to formulate the strategic approach to, uh, to developing human consciousness and behavior in this tribal planet. What are some of the rituals you would, what are the rich concrete ritualizations you would try to do to create kind of an awareness of limiting aggression, limiting consumption, doing something, you know, a concrete. Because see, now you may think that's funny and you may have an idea, oh my, that'd be, that would be silly to think about that. My view is it's crazy not to. And see, it is interesting. If we help the Polish economy, uh, there are going to be other uh, competition for American auto workers, see, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this, this is one of the international economy is a very interesting phenomenon in this context. So you're right. Uh, you, you, you help. It's very interesting, like at the end of World War II, the Marshall Plan. Uh, the Allies helped rebuild the economies of the vanquished. And now look today and think about it. It was 1945, Douglas MacArthur stood on the battleship Missouri and totally devastated Japan. Uh, it, by 1985, 40 years later, uh, the Japanese have won the economic war against the United States for all practical purposes. Uh, and Germany is not far behind. And with the unification of Europe now, you see this interesting in antiodromia happening. Uh, now, you were going to raise a question, Eileen. It's kind of related. Um, you're talking about the importance of consciously ritualizing. And I take that to mean ritualizing with understanding. Yes, it has to be. Uh, we got to understand. the. We have to understand the plumbing of the way human consciousness works and feeds into social and intergroup and international relationships and interreligious relationships. Right. So you're reading me right. Okay, so my question is, it seems to me that in the pre-modern world that was not possible to ritualize with understanding, and you're not promoting a return to that kind of ritualization, so I'm trying to understand the difference. Between okay, let me address that a little bit more. Okay. One of the things the scholars have pointed out to us about pre-modern tribal cultures that early Christian anthropologists did not understand. The early Christian anthropologists thought that Christians were superior in every way to the to the tribal cultures and it's embarrassing to read these early Christian anthropologists arrogance and they're talking about the different tribal cultures that they were studying they did not understand them at all and they did not realize the incredible sophistication of tribal ritual elders in ritual process and its relationship to consciousness 
I would say to you that most tribal cultures were light years ahead of us in their understanding of the relationship between ritualization and consciousness. I cannot take you to too many sophisticated psychologists and psychoanalysts today and show you anybody that knows anything about ritualization and consciousness. There are only a handful of people around the world that are studying the relationship between ritual process, a la Victor Turner, and psychoanalysis and psychological processes. And, and, and see, if you just look at that, the most sophisticated people of our time psychologically are only now beginning to say, oh, you mean what we call transference is a ritual phenomenon? And the psychoanalyst is a ritual elder in a transformative process? Oh, we thought that anybody that engaged in ritual was crazy. See, that's the Freudian point of view, classic Freudian. <laughs> Now, it's embarrassing how primitive we are on this, but the cutting edge, the cutting edge in psychoanalytic theory today is the understanding that the human psyche is affected by ritualization processes. The great breakthrough actually came with Eric Erickson, who began to point out ritualization in the psyche but we've made a lot of progress since then. I mean, uh, not a lot in terms of what needs to be done. For example, hypnosis. Hypnosis is a ritual phenomenon. It's very old. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the modern Christian antagonism toward magic, based on those early Christian anthropologists that didn't understand magic at all. See, magic is nothing other than understanding the relationship of, between what you do in ritual and the kind of consciousness you form. See, if you were an old tribal medicine man and you, you realize, that, well, it's time for a war party. Well, now, the old tribal medicine man knew how to create a war warrior. And it was done ritually. And then when all the young warriors came home, they knew, well, we've got to turn these boys, young men, back from warriors into uh, herdsmen again. And so the old medicine man knew how to create a ritual, do a ritual to create, I mean, transform the warriors back into herdsmen. You steal all these horses, you've got to take care of them, right? See? Think about this now. I'm not jesting. And think about what has happened to our Vietnam War vets. We have hospitals all over the United States who are full of young warriors, not so young now because we've failed them, uh, but they were made into warriors by ritual elders who were ritually tone deaf, a bunch of drill sergeants who know how to turn people into warriors. They know how chiefly to turn people into shadow warriors, what I call shadow warriors, that is people that don't know the moral, the moral responsibilities of a warrior. And then they come home, and we don't even have somebody that says, okay, boys, let's get together. We're going to have a dance, and we're going to dance you out of warrior into herdsman. So we've got in all these veterans administration hospitals across the face of this country thousands and thousands of young men who have been betrayed by us because we are ritually tone deaf. We don't know. We knew how to dance them into being killers, but we don't know how to dance them into being uh, people that can deal with their issues and have families and build communities and so forth and so on. And then these young men know something's wrong. If you ever if you ever work with any of the people that are either working with them or if you get to know them yourself, they know they've been betrayed. And they're right. But the great tragedy is that we have not put enough work together on spirituality and ritual to understand that how we've betrayed them. We have betrayed them because of the collapse of ritualization in modernity. Yes, back here. Uh, it's happened after every modern war. But you see, the difference with, between, uh, with those is even after World War II, there was, a, there was a order 
a, a religious order still more or less in place. And those young men coming back from World War II could feel that they had been engaged in a moral war, whether they were or not. See. Uh, and so they could come back into a cosmos, in other words, a world, a cosmos. And I'll get into Iliadi more in a minute about what a cosmos is. It's a, it's a world where your sacred canopy has not collapsed. See, after World War II, you still had a sacred canopy in America to a degree. After Korea, see, after Korea, it was collapsing, and by the time Vietnam had arrived, there was no sacred canopy in America. I, you, look at Peter Berger's book by that name. You'll see what I mean. Peter Berger's work, The Sociologist of Knowledge on the Homeless Mind, The Sacred Canopy, uh, where he discusses uh, the collapse of the sacred canopy. Uh, I, we're going to take a break in a minute because uh, you need to stretch your legs. But... Uh, what I will do when we come back from the break is I will try to get you to see what has happened in the modernization process. And this is where Eliade is helpful. The sacred canopy of myth has collapsed for moderns and for modern culture. And that means there isn't anything to return to. There's no cosmos, even a tribal cosmos. There's no tribal cosmos anymore. This is like being an American Indian and... Uh, and having your cosmos, your tribal cosmos, collapse on you, and then all you've got is is uh, is uh, self-destructive uh, 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 use of alcohol, drugs, etc., etc., etc. And this is happening. It's not just the American Indians. We're all into we're all into self-medication now. Yes. It's a ritualization to inhibit aggression. And it was contrasting that with mentioned Vietnam veterans when they protesters. Yes. Yes. Well, I want to make it very clear that our that our most aggressive violent sports are ritual or unconscious ritualizations. They're really acting out, but they're better than nothing. Because if you were to shut down professional sports in this country for about one year, the enormous increase in violence and violent crime would blow your mind, maybe literally. Human culture, if the leaders forget how to dance or forget how to throw one, uh, then, you, then what do we turn to? Well, the best we have is uh, uh, Mick Jagger uh, and Willie Nelson. And they still know how to throw a dance, but, and it works for a while. But, but it doesn't work in the way we need for it to work. Let's take about a 10-minute break. The uh, healers, the ritual elders, what I would call the, the, the magi, have, uh, have been aware that you need to, to have a diagnosis before you start your treatment. Now, there are a lot of people today that differ with that, but uh, uh, I think... I, I tend to go with the, with, with, with the, the vast uh, uh, group of the human community against the opinions of a lot of these modernists. I think that we have to have a sense for what, what the plumbing of this problem is. And the exciting thing to me is that in recent years we have, we have had analyses of, the, of these problems that when you put them together make what to me is a very coherent picture. Of our of our problem. I'll give you a list of these scholars uh, that you can look at to get some sense for the way we need to diagnose modernity. Uh, I've got some of them here, uh, but with Iliadi, let me give you a couple of others. And then I'm going to come back and, and tell you what, what I see them saying. Uh, there, as I mentioned Peter Berger and his work. He's a sociologist, one of the great sociologists. Uh, that is, if you have the interest that we have in this workshop. And he has studied modernization and the way it leads to fragmentation in, in human uh, personality and culture. And his book, The Homeless Mind, and his books, uh, a, Rumor of An a Rumor of Angels, The Sacred Canopy, uh, and one called the uh, 
got imperative in the title. I'll try to remember exactly what, what the title of the other one was. Does anybody know that Peter Berger book that has imperative in the title? I'll try to get that for you. His work is important work. You ought to get to know the work of Peter Berger because it'll give you a sophisticated critique of modernity, a sociology of knowledge critique of modernity, which goes with Iliadi and goes with a number of others. I want, I want you to see that we have some very, very sophisticated... But anyway, so, so he's one. Another one that a lot of Jungians don't like, but I increasingly admire is the work of Peter Homans, H-O-M-A-N-S. A lot of Jungians just cannot stand Peter Homans because he, he uh, used a, um, a cohesion self-psychology approach to, to understand the conflict between Freud and Jung and uh, looked at Jung's uh, narcissistic pathology, which in my view was substantial. Uh, but you need to understand that I think that probably everybody in this room has substantial narcissistic pathology, so I'm not running down Jung. I think we just need to understand that we all have severe narcissistic problems. Uh, and we all, I was talking to, uh, to one of you at, at the break, uh, uh, and we agreed that we ought to have a Humans Anonymous 12-step program uh, to deal with our residual narcissistic pathology. And if we could get that going, we would, we would address most of these issues in a significant way. I'm not just joking. Uh, but anyway, in that book, in his book, Jung in Context, in Holman's book, Jung in Context, if you'll read that and you'll try to kind of control your anger at him because he shows you Jung's shadow, uh, and read his analysis of the modernization process and what happens in the modernization process. And then when his new book comes out, he's got a new book coming out called, it's something, I, I'll try to get this before tomorrow to get the exact title, but it has to do with mourning, modernity and mourning the mourning process, in which he elaborates the approach to the understanding of the psychology of modernization, which he began in that book on Jung, and he has elaborated this psychology of modernization in a much more extensive way in this book that's coming out with the University of Chicago Press, I think, this year. If you put those two books together, you get this sophisticated understanding of, uh, of the longings that we have in modernity and the way in which we have, the loss, what is the loss that we have had as modernization and secularization have occurred? Well, what we have lost is enormous, contrary to what secularists think. And I want to, before we break for lunch, I want to lay out for you uh, in a very simple way, and we'll be, I'll be going over this again, but uh, see, modernists and secularists and atheists like to pretend that that the world has made this giant leap toward humanization with the modernization process. There could be nothing that's further from the truth than that. But they love to push that, and it's been, that's the dominant ideology around, around the world among intellectuals. Uh, uh, it's one of the reasons why Jung is not popular in university faculties. Because, you see, Jung is not a secularist. And anybody that values Jung is, they know he's not a secularist. And so if you show yourself, if, if you go into a very, very secular dominated faculty, you should not politically uh, come out as a Jungian until you pass your exams. <laughs> I say that only half in jest. Um, but the thing about it is that there has been an enormous loss. And what is that? Well, it's the realm of the sacred. And, of course, as long as nobody studied the psychology of all this, you could kind of get into, well, we're being free, now we're free of all these priests. You know, the French fantasy, you know. Uh, <laughs> now we're free of the kings, and we're free of these priests, and we're free of all these religious people telling us what to do, and now we're going to have civilization, and we're going to have humanity, blah, blah, blah. And, and it was a wonderful fantasy, the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment fantasy was, was a beautiful fantasy. And you know, you need to study that. Study the history of the Enlightenment to get a sense of the fantasy about progress without God, you know. I mean, you know, get rid of all this God stuff and all these priestcraft, and we'll have progress unlimited. And then we have the Titanic, you know, the unsinkable ship of, uh, of secularization and Enlightenment and technology. And... Uh, 
about the time that modern enlightenment civilization and science began to peak out, which was right before World War I. Right before World War I, the pride of the modern West was at its height. And we had an unsinkable ship, and we had an increasing sophistication among civilizations. They were Christian, but better than being Christian, they were scientifically advanced. And we had the Germany of Goethe, you know, and we had the, the England of David Hume and the great positivistic uh, non-believers, Bertrand Russell, the world that came to be the world of Bertrand Russell. What have we got here? The Proud Tower of Barbara Tucker. Yeah. But anyway, so what happens? You get the singing of the Titanic, and all of a sudden you find yourself in the middle of World War I, in which, uh, you know, the interesting thing about the Civil War, I was just in the South, you know, you can't forget the Civil War in the South. They remember it like it was yesterday. But anyway, the Civil War in America was the beginning of modern warfare. You had the beginning of modern warfare in the Civil War in America, but it was just a very, barely the little beginning. They didn't really have machine guns yet, see. Uh, and the first World War was the first war which, which, in which we see the the results of modernization, full blown, in warfare. And uh, so you have this picture, all quiet, read all quiet on the Western Front, and you begin to have grave doubts about this project of modernization among some folk. And that's where you get the work beginning of people like C.S. Lewis and that whole group that wrote Tolkien and the whole group of people that began to to raise serious questions out of the height of our modern civilization about what is wrong here. There is something radically wrong that they didn't tell us. Well, you've got to get a sense about what is wrong, but you need psychoanalytic theory to get a completion on this picture here. Because as long as you can think, yeah, demythologization, wow, it's great. You know, and that's what, you know, when I was in uh, uh, studying this stuff for the first time back in the 60s, they were still into raw, raw demythologization. Okay. But let's look at Iliadi here and Jung. The interesting thing is that if you study Iliadi, he makes this enormously important point that not too many people have noticed as being very important. He says, for homo religiosus, that is, pre-modern human beings, the world, space, and time are heterogeneous. There are, there's not just one space and time, not just one world, see. There is the, there is the world of the profane, and there's the world of the sacred, the world of myth. And he says, Iliadi says, and this is where you really, you start reading the sacred and the profane. If you have, how many of you read the sacred and the profane? Okay, now that's part of your assignment. You got to get Iliadi, the sacred and the profane. And he will lay this out for you in a way I can't really do very elaborately. But the point of it he makes, and then I, if you can get my little essay that I wrote in this book called Anthropology and the Study of Religion, my essay in there called Space and Time and Human Transformation. I think it's just space, space and transformation is the title of it. But anyway, there is this radical distinction between ordinary space-time and sacred space and time. And Iliadi's argument is that for the history of the human race prior to the modernization process, this was always the case. Now, in other words, when you were a pre-modern person, you, would, you felt the need to make contact with the divine realm regularly. Think about the liturgical year. The liturgical year is a vestige of insights from that time. The Mass is a refugee from a world in which it was important to go to the Axis Mundi, the center. Now remember this. This is the human world down here. Now we're gone. Here's the This world is full of numinosity and sacredness and power and food and grace. 
And this, and this is not just Christian according to Iliadi, this is the say, homo religi, the world of homo religiosis that existed for aeons prior to modernity. In other words, the vast amount of human history, this has been the view. And you need to be clear, my view is we got to get back to it. So I'm telling you, the preview, we must get back to this if we are to survive. We've got to do it differently than they did, but we must get back to it. This is the axis money, the center of the world. And of course, in Christian thought, what is this? Come on, you Roman Catholic theologians. What is this? In Christian, Orthodox Christian theology. Hmm? Hell. Oh, no, this is not hell. This is not hell. Yeah, where does it come in? Yeah, and where? This is a literal place for Christians. This is the cross. And the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, bread of life, comes in through the cross of Christ. And through the, through the, through the grace coming in from the sacred, through the body and blood of Christ, we are healed and we are fed and we are made whole. We cannot be made whole without it. That is to say, there is this primordial intuition. There's this primordial intuition in Orthodox Catholic Christianity that you may argue about it all you want to theologically, and you theologian, theologian, systematic theologian can just have a field day with it, and it's wonderful. But psychologically, Jung was right. It's true. Psychologically, this is true. There is a connection that the psyche must make with a non-ego world through which it can be centered and nourished and made whole in the face of all the brokenness that inevitably is the case in historical time. See, this is profane time. This is historical time. This is clock time. This is chronos. In chronos, we are all alienated, as Peter Berger would say, and we are broken. Or as Tillich would say, Paul Tillich, the great Lutheran theologian, we are estranged. We live in estrangement. Uh, but this is a different kind of time that we touch, that Christians claim that they touch in the Mass. But what you got to realize, this is the time that a Muslim, I had a great conversation yesterday with a Shia. You know, if you want to learn about Shia Islam, you just talk to your cab driver in Chicago. <laughs> I had this great trip from the airport yesterday. I learned a lot about uh, uh, Shiite Islam, see. But for, for a Muslim, you go to Mecca and you circumambulate the Kaaba and you walk with your feet this whole thing you 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 go on a journey to the center see according to Iliadi humans must go on a journey to the center that is until modernity what happens with modernity somebody what happens in modernity do you go on journeys to the center journeys to the outside huh you journey to the outside right but but what about the center in modernity there isn't one According to Iliadi, and he's absolutely right about this, when you become truly modern psychologically and culturally, you can't find the center anymore. There isn't one. Why? Well, see, if you were... Enough, that's, remember, now, this is... I, I'm just saying that, that in, in Orthodox Catholic Christianity, you've got this stuff in dogma and ritual laid out for you, and whether you agree with it or not theologically, I'm not worried about, but you need to understand that that's an elaboration. Jung was right. That's an elaboration of psychological reality that's very accurate many ways. Uh, John Dorley would say it's not totally accurate. And we'll talk a little bit about Dorley later. Don't let me forget tomorrow to talk about the work of John Dorley. I agree with it. I was just at the conference. John and I were lecturing down in North Carolina together. It's, it's kind of like Kairos, Kronos, thank you. Kairos. Can I spell that right? Okay. You see, a lot of people, though, or they're kind of funny about Kairos. A lot of Christians, they don't understand this. They say, well, now, Kairos is the fullness of time. Kairos is, Kairos is those pregnant moments. And so they put 
emphasis on Kairos as is experienced from from Kronos. And, and of course that's right. I mean, there are these times in which you, there, you do experience this fullness and pregnant, ready to be birthed time. You do experience that. But what they don't get, they need to have Iliadi to get this, see. Kairos is always pregnant. There's never a time when Kairos is not pregnant and full. See, that's, that's where a lot of the people that talk about, well, Kairos, you know, it's just pregnant moment. It's like it just comes once in a thousand years or once every two thousand years or something. But, but see, that's a misunderstanding. The reality, spiritual reality, that that's talking about is always full. Iliadi talked about it. This is the sacred. Now, okay, so I'm this primitive herdsman, right? And I've got my family. I may be Abraham or somebody, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm wandering around in the desert, you know, and I'm getting tired of this, and I'm getting tired of feeling lost. So I'm just lucky that I know about rituals of divination, right? So I get my goat, the special one that's been revealed to me in my dreams or something, and I set this goat loose because I know this is a sacred goat. And this goat will find the center of the world. It's going to find this spot. Now, I do not know where this spot is, but my goat will find it. So my goat wanders, and we all follow that goat. And when that goat stops, in biblical tradition, what would we call it? Bethel. We know that that is the sacred space, the center of the world, the Oxus Mundi. This is where Jacob's ladder is. See? <coughs> Traffic between the sacred and the profane realm. And then I'll have a sacrifice there, put up a bunch of stones, we'll have an altar there. And this is true throughout the human race, you see. No matter what tradition, they all did this at some, at some level, still do. If you travel around the world, it's, is uh, as I love to do, and you and you go throughout every culture and every place on this globe, and I will guarantee you, you will find places where the human beings have done this, and they've been there for thousands, some of them for thousands of years, and they have survived through the different religions that control them. And so, for those of us that love Jerusalem, it's been sa it's been a sacred space. Whether the Muslims had it, or the Jews had it, or the Christians had it, and it will always be, as long as the planet survives, uh, a representation in the mind of human beings of, of one place that there, this was. Well, Mecca is the same thing. The great mountain of the Islamic pilgrimage has been sacred long before there was a Mohammed. It was a site of pilgrimage long before Mohammed ever existed. And all Mohammed did, uh, from just a history of religion's point of view, was to organize a lot of things that already existed in terms of ritual practices around these sacred centers that later became known as Islam. Uh, and uh, Iliadi lays out for you the way in which uh, the, the symbolism of the sacred stone that is at the heart of Islam uh, uh, pre-existed. There's a great dissertation done by a man... Uh, Harry Park. I don't think Harry ever published this dissertation. It should be published. It's a dissertation on the Islamic pilgrimage. And he traces the the, the sacred stone worship that preceded uh, the, the uh, pilgrimage to Mecca to the forms that exist today. So do you follow what I'm getting at? There is always this, this uh, human journey to the center. And there's another, <clears throat> let me give you a, a reference of Victor Turner's. That he's got an essay that was done, I think it was published in History of Religions, called Journey, see, Pilgrimage, Journey to the Center Out There. And uh, Victor Turner and, and his wife, Edith, before Vic's death, published this book called Image and Pilgrimage in Christian Culture. And if you haven't seen that, it's a must. Image and pilgrimage in Christian culture. The understanding of pilgrimage that is in that book is something that applies to a lot more than Christian culture. It applies to every human culture because every human culture has pilgrimage.
and if you have a Jungian point of view to complete the psychological side, then you've got an understanding of this that is integrated. Okay. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.